Welcome, everybody, back here to Siegel Talk at the Markney Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the City University of New York, here in the middle of Manhattan in Midtown, which is still empty. Uh, so many stores are um, uh, leaving. I just yesterday went out and tried to get some electric supplies for Lambic, closed overnight the stores and uh, even so, there are lots of signs of recovery, especially here. We are still in a, in a, um, in a moment of, um, of uncertainty. And um, this is especially, of course, true for the performing arts um, in New York City. It's been devastating. Uh, well, there's done two artists, uh, many, many artists, uh, speak, spoken word artists, actors, directors, dancers, but also for uh, musicians, especially it's been no possibility to, uh, to really perform. Uh, yesterday we heard John from the Great Kaufman Music Center, what they did in the musical storefronts. I think it's an extraordinary activity um, that they put up. Uh, we heard from uh, Bob Wilson last week what he's planning out in Watermill and his work. And um, so I think it's time that we highlight uh, what's being done now. Last year we were in the middle of the shock, the immediate um, um, uh, aftermath of, of this. And we spoke to over 150 artists in 50 countries. And now it's the big question, Bastoon, what to do? What shall we do now? And um, there are uh, many initiatives and there are many great artists, curators, administrators, producers working. And with us today, we have one of the leaders in the field. We think of the musician and uh, Mr. Petra uh, Mushievich, and uh, he is uh, with us. So Petra, first of all, thank you for taking out the time to be uh, with us. Um, Petra has performed a virtual Solo recitals for 92nd Street Y, Spoleto Festival in the USA, Maverick Concert in the Orchestra of St. Luke's, Bach Festival, the Schubert Club in St. Paul's, and concerts by Chopin and Mozart with Atlanta and Billings symphonies in this uh, pandemic season. Though. So uh, Peja is a musician, a very, very accomplished one, and um, our heart also reaches out for you guys. It's uh, in, unimaginable how it means not to perform, not to how to rehearse for yourself. It's a, it's a devastating. And uh, I once was last September or in November in a, on a concert on the street. A great uh, band was playing. It's also been fantastic Billy musicians. And they said, this is the biggest concert you see at the moment in New York City. And they were happy to be out there in their, in their jackets. And, um, and so um, it's incredible. But uh, Pedja also in this contemporary art world where we live in the phase, the moment after postmodernism in a way, he is a hybrid artist uh, and who not only defines his artist's work as being at the piano, creating scores and, uh, re and creating music, um, he also is an artistic uh, administrator, an arts administrator, and he sees that as a significant part of his work. Um, as Joseph Boyce, in a way, said that the idea of the social sculpture, the structure, all work we do should be artistic, should follow artistic work, and um, it's especially true. And he's at the famous and significant Baryshnikov uh, Art Center in New York. Um, which has done so much uh, for the community and uh, Baryshnikov has created something uh, that I think uh, really shines uh, strongly in a way. He's also a collaborator of Bob Wilson. So he also felt, you know, we should have a space where artists can show work, encourage, have residencies. And he put a lot of work behind it and also was able to raise funds. And we are truly uh, grateful for him. Um, but uh, Petra also is at the Tippett Rice Art Center in Montana. And we really want to know how he uh, combines all these worlds and what he does uh, in the time of Corona. He curates and produces also film shoots for dozens of musicians. I think he was just in Boston yesterday or like two days ago. And um, right now he says he's developing his cooking skills and, um, and he's sharing it also online. So um, Petra, welcome. Where are you at the moment? Thank you. Great to be here. I'm in my apartment in New York City, in Chelsea, uh, where I've been for most of the last year, which has been very interesting. It's usually my life consists of a lot of traveling. And I have to say, it's been kind of a joy to be at home. It's been a bit of a, a guilty pleasure to be at home. But in the last uh, two months or so, I've started traveling. And, and I my first trip was actually to Montana. I played with Billing Symphony. And actually, they had 20% of audience in the house. And that was amazing. It was like 
finding water in desert to go walk out on the stage and see people. It was it was beautiful. So you know we've all missed that. But I've been very lucky that I've been working constantly the whole pandemic, filming uh, first very grassroots in my apartment, and then as the pandemic went on, both for my own work as a pianist and then my work at Bershko Art Center and at Tippett Rise, we started to ask ourselves, how can we make this more creative and more really multidisciplinary and really, you know, if, if we're asking you to watch something besides listening, what can we contribute in the visual way? Which is interestingly, it has always been a great interest of mine. I do believe that concert is a multidisciplinary experience because just like when you go to, to eat in a restaurant, before you had a bite, you walked in, you saw the design of the place, you saw the layout, you saw the lighting, you smelled something. And, you know, a good 30% of your impression was already created before you even saw the menu. And I think the same thing happens in concert halls. So both Tippet Rise and Bershko Art Center, in very different ways, are experiential in that sense that you really get a full... Um, at Tippet Rise, it's a 12,000 acre ranch with huge sculptures and at Bershko at Center, we are in the middle of Midtown. So we're very aware of that you're coming from this bustling you know, city and how can we create a little oasis before you even heard anything. So uh, we set out to go to artist studios, to museums, to interestingly designed houses and film musicians. And we really invited film directors to really leave their stamp on that music. I mean, I really encourage directors to, to, to tell us how they see this music and, and a musician and the space we're in. So it's been really, really fascinating. Hmm. That's, uh, that's, that's quite something. Then put together, I think it was Gertrude Stein who said, the more you see, the more you hear. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and both, both organizations, I'm, so proud to say that that we immediately said what can we do now what can we do now to provide paid work for the artists and be it commissioning or presenting digitally or presenting archival things and uh giving people space to work and uh, with these films also engaging film directors and directors of photography and audio engineers because our entire community has been as you well aware so affected by this pandemic so tell us, what do you do? What does it really mean? What do you do at Barishnikov and at, uh, at Tippett? So tell us, what did you do with the time of Korean? Very, the projects and your ideas behind the vision. Well, in, in, both, in both places, I'm involved in the, on the programming side, obviously. That's my strength is, is programming. And in the past, that involved you know, programming live concerts in front of audiences. And Tippett Rise is a, a summer season in Montana. We usually have 22 or 23 concerts over five or six weeks. And uh, Bershko Art Center is the opposite. We usually don't have a summer season. So it's a, it's a year of the year. And Bershko Art Center is an arts organization that has two um, kind of arms of operation. One is developing works, meaning giving artists space to rehearse to with, with their collaborators without any obligation of performing and without even any obligation to uh, bring the, the work to fruition. It, it, it can be just something you want to explore. You need two weeks of studio time to explore something that you may decide was a terrible idea. And then we also present in all three disciplines in, in music, dance, and theater. So, but interestingly, there, there are some striking similarities, even though this, these two organizations are not related, but they are very much a uh, passion of, in Berisha Art Center case, of one person, of Mikhail Bereshnikov, and in Tippett Rise case of the founders, Peter and Kathy Halstead. So there's a very hands-on, uh, almost uh, hospitality, because it's like, it's this sense of like, well, this is our house, so <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Can I get you a drink? Or do you need something? Where are you gonna sit? So it's not uh, kind of a, a large organization. And uh, it's it's very intimate. And then the other thing that, that both organizations are are passionate about is affordable ticket prices. So you know that that art is really accessible to everybody at Tippett Rise. It's ten dollars at the First Court Center is, is twenty five and under and often free. So I think uh, there was a very conscious decision made that that you know 
while art should feel like a luxury product, it should not cost like a luxury product. Hmm. So what and then, of course, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just want to say that, of course, the pandemic changed all this. So uh, in, in case of Tipper Rise, we became a year-round presenter of these films and, and commissioning. And both organizations got it. Because the first thing where everything was shut down, we realized that the first thing one can do is create work. So at Version Art Center, we set out with commissioned eight artists right away to, to do work. And then the moment we were allowed to go into the space, we gave them space to go in and develop those works at our studios. And then interestingly, we, we had this concert uh, scheduled for a live performance in, in this season uh, that was uh, kind of centered about Fred Erzhevsky's work called Coming Together, which is a work for narrator and a group of instruments. And the text comes from an inmate in Attica prison who led the revolt against police brutality. And then of course, with all the incredibly relevant social uh, situation that we are in and, and uh, thinking and movements from Black Lives Matter to social justice, when we were shut down and you know, for public performances, we all decided that this has to happen. So it was the, it was the first, uh, thing we filmed in our space when we were allowed to go in. And it ended up being a co-presentation between Tipper Rice Art Center and Bershtiko Art Center and Five Borough Music Festival and Bay Chamber Concerts in Maine. Because we all felt that this was such an interesting and important work that you know we wanted to share it with as many people as possible. And it was really fascinating because it was really baby steps of people trying to be together, to, to have seven musicians in one room amongst these very strict regulations of you know, distancing and uh, entering the building and, and cleaning the spaces and, and air filters. And it was really full of all sorts of emotions, the, the tenderness towards making music together again, and then uh, fear, you know, we were all, we didn't know, <laughs> and then we also uh, found and engaged a uh, pastor Isaac Smith, who was a former inmate, to be the filmmaker. So it was a really, really interesting project that both organizations participated in. So that was that was really kind of meaningful to me. So and and then of course since then we've all started to do more filming, but at first it was all a real unknown. Wait, what months was that when you did the first? That was in September. That was in September, That's early yeah. September. Well, yeah. And in September, each week or each month, you do a creative film or a video inside version? Oh, no. Uh, well, no, the, there, is, there has been pretty much consistent activity at Bershiko Art Center as far as development of work. And we've been. Tell uh, us a bit. Post, so we've been, uh, 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 we've commissioned artists ranging from choreographers like Carl Marshall and Stephanie Baden Bland and, and uh, 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 kind of media and sound artists they blow. And, and so they've been creating works that we were that we filmed and then we are still in the process of presenting interspersed with archival uh, films that we've been releasing. And for instance, this week, we just released a concert that we presented, I guess, a couple of years ago with the Tesla Quartet playing quartets by Shimonovsky and Janoshek. And, uh, Alexander Smithers singing Barrio Sequenza that was kind of done in our sort of trade, trademark uh, salon slash cabaret style and slightly staged. So, uh, so there's been a fair amount of activity, but obviously, you know, these are smaller projects because we really cannot have easily have a rehearsal with, you know, 10 actors or 10 dancers. So it's, it's been an interesting uh, way to function creatively. But on the other hand, when you really think about it, all of us always function within limitations. Those limitations may be spatial or geographical or financial. So now just those limitations are a little tighter. So you think, okay, I have this much playground. I'm still going to play. <laughs> so been interesting. So and you release it once a week or uh, you have a uh, Well, okay. it's been this, this, uh, year it has been practically once once a week of something yeah and on the tip of rise side uh 
coincidentally, we are releasing this weekend, started this evening. We have a little three-day festival when we will release 10 films that we filmed in New York in the fall and winter in three different locations, in two different locations at the Mena Center at the Joel Shapiro studio in Long Island City with his magnificent sculptures. And uh, with great range of music with, from Richard Good reading poetry and playing music by Bach and, and Brahms and also a Mozart sonata to a world premiere by Bora Yoon played by Claire Chase to you know songs sung by Tyler Duncan and Erica Switzer and violinist Dessa Lark and then uh, Ben Bileman and Gabe Cabezas playing a duo by Jesse Montgomery and then also playing a partita by Chris Rogerson that he had commissioned. So these are uh, our kind of first um, uh, showing of these these films that we've been making and they will we will have a live conversation with some of the artists preceding these uh, films at 7 30 eastern time today tomorrow and sunday and then the films will remain available to watch at any time and we've just started filming for the next batch of these films <laughs> and as i've said repeatedly now when i watch a tv show or a film and i see the credits at the end that they are hundreds of people now i know what they do <laughs> All of this takes a lot of coordination and a lot of things that I've really learned on the job. And it's been fascinating. And especially looking at this first batch of films, it's, mm -hmm. it's funny when you, when I think, oh, we filmed five people in one day. That's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, you learn things. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite it's quite uh, 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 stunning to think that what a live performance with bodies in a room, bodies who age at the same time, often as some people point out, even the heartbeat synchronizes, but it's gone. It's right. never been right. the same. It's an ephemeral experience. Yeah. Now, no people in the room, but it's filmed, put in a form, and maybe in a hundred years from now, people will say, "Look what people did in New York." Uh, in the time of the pandemic and they can see it, they can hear right. it. And it's, you know, it's interesting because I, I really felt that I did not, not want to pretend that this was a concert. I felt like if we're making videos, then let's really go that direction and let's explore what can this art form do and how can we create a different experience that's actually, uh, that I can with two feet on the ground, ask you to watch rather than just listen. So it's been a really, really interesting exploration of lighting design and haze machines and <laughs> sculptors. And, <laughs> and, you know, we're, we're shooting at the Noguchi Museum next week, which I'm very excited about, which is such a beautiful space. And, uh, you know, uh, the Tibet Rise is a, uh, as I said, 12,000 acre ranch, which is also a, a sculpture park and a music festival. So this, this marriage of, of visual art of all kinds and particularly sculptor, sculptures and music was kind of a natural uh, exploration for us to do both at, at Noguchi Museum and hopefully at Storm King. So we're really exploring those uh, connections, but then each one of those things is a, is a rabbit hole of questions. You know, Storm, Hill, the Storm King, there's not a really flat space on the grass. So how do you put five musicians to play? <laughs> you know, there are all these logistical questions and where, where is the sun coming from? And you know, how long is going to be in the shade? All these things you never thought about. <laughs> the little waves of myelin, you know. Maybe <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's all so fascinating. And, and, you know, I think in so many ways, especially classical music was overdue for a shakeup of how we present something. Uh, the price certainly been high with this pandemic, but I think it's a great time to rethink how do we share what we want to share, this amazing art form that's been around and the new work that's created today. How do we share it with as many people as possible? And then, of course, the other obvious thing is just like for your program, there's no more local presentation. Everything is global. But that also means that we are all, as, as consumers, we are overwhelmed with content. And every day I feel like I could watch this and I could watch national theater and I could watch this and I could. <laughs> so that also creates a bit of an overload and how do you select what you watch? Which is an interesting marketing question, but on the flip side, you know, you get emails from people from India and Israel and saying, I love that theater piece with, with which we, with Bershkova, we, we got an email from somebody from Israel and we thought, but it was four in the morning there, <laughs> you know. What are the numbers? Do you have statistics? 
if you wanted to. Oh, I, I'm so bad with numbers. They range greatly. They range from hundreds to thousands, uh, depending on, on the, you know. Many, many depending more than normally reach in a concert. In the yes, percentage. absolutely. Because both Bershko Art Center and Tippett Rise are very intimate venues. I mean, our largest venue, I mean, our venues at Bershko Art Center range from 60 to 220, and the Tippett Rise is 130 or so. And definitely, definitely more than double and often much more than that. So that is, of course, very exciting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is it's quite some, and you're going for it. Do you think it will be a radical change for Tippett or Barishnikov, that experience? Or do you think it's a break in between, it will go back? Or do you feel this really changed what we are doing? Uh, yes, not change in a, in a full change, but this will be an additional activity. There is no doubt that both of us, both of these organizations will continue providing digital content as we go back to live performance. Because I think we've both realized that A, it's another art form and B, we can reach uh, further. And so I think it's a really, really interesting way of sharing arts and, and making it more, you know, democratically available to anybody at any time. And, and so, so yes, it's definitely, within the missions of both organizations, I, I believe. So how did you do it staff wise? Did you retrain your staff or people already knew enough? Are you hire outside? How do you do all the film work? Well, personally, I have spent uh, my lifetime with a, a ma major uh, philosophy that not knowing something never stopped me from doing it. <laughs> so I learned, I asked, uh, it's, I, you know, I, I love to ask people. So I, I reached out to people and, you know, as far as filming, I knew nothing. When I first, a person on my piano side, when everything got shut down, I was interestingly at Tippet Rise uh, doing a recording session in March, recorded the kind of a, a Bach family album of music by Johann Sebastian, Karl Philipp and Wilhelm Friedman Bach. And in this idyllic, you know, eight inches of snow, all white, at night, I was the only person on the ranch, which was kind of extraordinary for an urban dweller like me. And then, you know, working with our amazing audio staff. And so I flew in, it was Sunday. I remember it was March 14th, I think. And I went to my favorite restaurant called Chiquito in, in Chelsea. And I said at the bar, they said, well, we're gonna shut down tomorrow. And I was like, really? Like this thing is really? So, you know, in the next couple of days, everything shut down. Little by little, you know, sort of few weeks by few weeks, all of my concerts got canceled. So my first next engagement was a recital at 92nd Street Y. And they asked me if I would film something. And I said, no, because I had never owned a microphone in my life. My first camera I ever had was when I got my first iPhone. So it was not something that I was naturally interested in, or I know that I was actively not interested. It's just something I never did. But then as everything got canceled, once the, the whole summer got canceled, and that was within a week or so, you know, everything just knocked up. because like May was canceled, June was canceled. I realized that I had to do something or I would go completely crazy. So I called them back and I said, okay, I think I want to film something. So they said, okay. So then I asked people, what should I get? So I got this microphone. I learned that this inimitable New York fashion that while I looked at Amazon and they said that, you know, I could get this mic delivered in three months, because of, of course there was a huge, you know, first of all issues with transportation. And then, you know, it was like everybody wanted to microphones and, and cameras. And somebody said to me, oh, you know, H&H, which is this amazing electronic store in New York. They said that you can order online and then walk up and pick up through a window was like, you know, illegal merchandise. <laughs> so I did that and I walked up, you know, they're five, six blocks from me. And it was, it felt so kind of adventurous and needless to say, I knew nothing what to do with this microphone, but I learned. And then I devised this program. I changed it slightly to what, from what I was going to play in person. And then I thought, well, I'm not interested in just putting this iPhone camera in one spot. I want to play around with it. So I set out to experiment treating the camera as an audience member and basically picking up this very tripod that I'm speaking with you now on and saying, 
would you mind if I moved you to another seat? <laughs> so I practiced this whole spiel while I was playing and then I would speak about music I was playing and then I would move the camera. And, you know, I filmed every day for about 15 days, the whole program, it was about an hour of music. Because I was really interested in exploring, you know, what can this be with the most primitive equip equipment? I mean, I, iPhone and this microphone. And so that that kind of put a germ, you know, put a bug in my head that to really explore. And once we got to more professional equipment and obviously actually hiring film directors who know what they're doing, I was really set out to, to really give them freedom and ask them, you know, what would you do? Here's the music, what would you do? So it's been really fascinating. Incredible. So you became a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker of your own work, your producer of your own video. In, in, <laughs> nothing you would have thought, you know, when you... Um, I also think Barishnikov, when he created, I don't, I don't know how he made it happen. Many people try to do things like this. Often it didn't work out, he did it. And yeah. I would not think that it would be close Corona time, but he would be producing a massive amount of videos that will be could be uploaded on screens to people. And such a radical change. We are so close to it. Maybe we don't even see what it means. What does it mean all to you? Do, do you feel your own software and your head, something that up there, do you look at the world different? Is something happening in your mind? Or is it a confirmation of what you said? I always try things out. So it's not that, or do you feel something is different? You know, it's so interesting. On, in, in, in essence, it's the same exploration of a full experience of anything, whether it's a meal I cook for my friends, or it's a concert I play live, or it's a concert I play for camera, or I produce for camera, or I you know, curate live. I always think of the full experience, and I am, oh, I am very interested in what does it mean besides just playing. So that's one answer. Um, on the other hand, it's it's so interesting because this pandemic in some ways, I'll try to formulate this not to annoy everybody, uh, has done the last thing the first world needed was to was to think even more about ourselves. You know, constantly checking what temperature this because <laughs> we're already on that road of kind of self-centeredness. <laughs> I feel like this pandemic has pushed us all a to be more or less alone and not not with many people, and then live in this constant fear of like, or at least for a while, quite active fear. Like, are, am I sick? Am I getting sick? Is did I cough because I have allergies, or am I sick? And and I just had this sort of uh, annoyance because I'm really not interested in thinking about myself. And but of course, thinking about others was was actually challenging because I wasn't around people at least the beginning. And uh, until we really started hiring people, which which was fairly soon after, you know, the springtime, springtime. But still, you know, I realized how my entire what gives my life fuel are other people. So that's one aspect. On the other side, concurrently, we have this what to me is probably the most important socio, politically, culturally movement in decades from Black Lives Matter to social justice and all that, which is the exact opposite of that. So it's such an interesting uh, time to try to kind of figure out how can we connect these things and how can we, and it's something I I've always been so interested in how can art be more relevant in everyday life and, and to everybody. How can we, and I, I always follow, or not always, but for a long time, I've followed the path that food has done in this country in the last 20 or 30 years. And how can we in the arts follow that path that basically the level of food has risen in all economic structures. Basically everybody wants to eat better. And it's not only connected to once a year you go to a fancy restaurant in a suit and tie. So I keep thinking, what can we do to, to create performing arts where that's just something on a Wednesday at 5.45, you call your friend and say, hey, let's, let's see something. And that's not gonna kill your pocket. It's going to be um, a great experience, and you'll want more. So, so all of that is kind of mixed in in all, all this thinking. But of course, now the one thing we 
for the moment, we're making baby steps at the moment, but the actual having people in the same room has, it just proved to me how, what an essential part audience is in the performing arts, that it's a two-way street. So that was, that was, that was one I remember when that really, I, I was so depressed. I thought, oh, that's really the only thing I want to do, to be with people. But I think that this digital thing has reached people and, and I think we will just, it'll be all the sweeter when we can be together. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but it is, you know, as you said, Robert, first of all, our world, perhaps the first time we experience uncertainty for others is now in Africa where there's not even enough money for measles vaccinations. Um, I think about yeah. 400 people die from malaria, numbers yeah. constant, and uh, we are not aware of it. Uh, we had, uh, you know, our friends uh, from uh, from India, Abhijak Munda, who talked to us. He was looking out of the window, and four hundred thousand people would leave Delhi because of Corona. The houses didn't want them anymore, and they were mm -hmm. on a march of them up to eight, nine hundred kilometers, and they couldn't cross state lines. Um, it's happening actually again. There's a photo in the Times today. So and I think we experience that, but also globally. And um, so do you think uh, um, also America as a country, uh, besides that, will we go? Is it the idea just to go back how it was? Or do you feel also with the new government that is a moment of change? This is a moment, something is happening. Um, what, what, what is your feeling? What do the artists you talk to? What, what is Barishnikov? What's, where do you, and Tippett, you know, what's your feeling? Well, I, I first, I think that going back is not only physically, but also intellectually not an option ever, even though we may think sometimes that we go back to something, we always go forward. Uh, I, I do think that this is kind of a defining experience for us because what I'm hoping will it will result in is more humility, more um, uh, uh, empathy, um, and of course, <laughs> you know, arts are uh, very much part of humility and empathy. <laughs> There's nothing more humbling than being on stage. Doesn't matter who you are, anything can happen. <laughs> so that's, uh, and uh, so I do think that there is. I think there is. Um, well. I can speak of my experience. I think there is a renewed sense of community of we are in this together, even though we are actually not together physically. <laughs> I think there is, at least from what I see from artists I communicate with and also friends I, I see with, with great regularity actually for months now, there is this sense of we are in this together. And there is a, you know, a, a text, I haven't seen you in three days, are you okay? Which, you know, a year ago, just assume that I was somewhere else. So there is something nice about that, I think. Again, the price is very high. Uh, but I'm hoping that that uh, it will focus us on, on is more essential things than perhaps surfacey things, hopefully. And within the world of new presenting where you and also John, who was with us yesterday, moving is there a network emerging is there something where people talk we had Olga Garay uh, from Los Angeles who so, said so, so for the cultural commissioner who's very yeah. much connected to Los Angeles and but also to the Latino Cuban in the South American movement she said we created a network we feel uh, we are afraid we will be shut out you know what will happen America gets all vaccinated and the borders go up nobody is allowed from the entire world till in five years right. from now we're vaccinated what will happen to global presenting? We're going to have Joe Melillo on here. Also, it will be interesting to hear from him. Um, mm -hmm. after down. But um, um, is your world, do you feel also there are something, some roots, rhizomes, are because there are some networks are emerging or is it individual? I think it really depends on people. I've always been lucky to, to have a real network of colleagues and friends, whether it's on, on the musicians side as on my in my performing hat <laughs> or the arts administrator side I, I think you know different people function differently i i'm a i'm a herd person i love people and i love to be with people so i do have a lot of friends 
who I speak with very regularly about all these issues, you know, where we are and how can we do better and on every, on every level, including on diversity level. And I think the, the, the international thing is very interesting because now we're in a situation completely opposite than we thought we would be six months ago. Six months ago, we thought that Europe is gonna get vaccinated first. So I go, I spent three weeks in Verbier Festival for a few summers now, you know, sort of, I mean, I can't say regularly, but I've been going there for some years. And um, their attitude was, well, we will all be vaccinated. Now it's the polar opposite. We are all vaccinated, but they're not. They're still going ahead. We had this amazing meeting of, of planning all these, you know, chalets for people who text, tested positive, those who have to quarantine from countries that have to quarantine. I mean, it's a military operation. But then, you know, you start to think, okay, can I plan right after I fly back from Switzerland that I can just play a concert next day because maybe I'll have to quarantine because I'm coming from a country that may not be vaccinated because it's all changing all the time. So the, our previous mode of planning is completely challenged. So I have some performances in Spain in October and I was supposed to go to Los Angeles directly from there and I actually asked them to, to postpone it to April because I, I was afraid that I don't know what's going to happen in Spain in October. So it's all these things that are quite challenging. Um, but I think it's also, it, it's, it could end up being the polar opposite of what I said earlier, which is happening now, that in digital presentation, there is no local because everything is available wherever you are. And we may, when we make these baby steps, go really back to real local because the traveling, especially international traveling, may be you know, difficult for a while, which is, I think, not the worst thing. I think it's great to look around and say, who is my neighbor and what can you do? What can we do together? It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's a quite, a, quite a good point that in one way, it is really local, like the Kaufman Center said, we do this <laughs> and not even someone from Brooklyn is gonna come and walk by. Right. From right. Whom I was with. But on the other hand, someone, as you pointed out, in India and Sri Lanka and South Africa can watch it. And um, yeah. and a, anyway, there you know the carbon footprint of flying around, bringing over companies, orchestras, you know. So I think the change, thinking is changing um, in a little bit. And you said, you know, checking the temperatures. We are now aware that you know our body temperatures go up, and it's a dangerous sign. The Earth temperature goes up a couple of degrees. You might not survive like a tree. You put a tree on. I got a beautiful bonsai tree. I made a mistake. I had it on my heating, my heater, and they put on the overnight the um, the, the steam heat was dead the next morning. It was, it was too hot. You know, it didn't right. survive. And um, and these are the big changes. I think uh, um, as many people, Bruno, Tua, and others, you know, to, to now they say this is a maybe just a rehearsal for things to come. And even if this crisis behind us, others will come and climate change is an important part. Do you feel that in your context, there is also um, an awareness that um, we all knew about it, but there is a bigger urgency to engage. And what would, what are you going to guys going to do if so at Barishnikov or Tippett? Is, are there plans or do you well, I think in both organizations, they are continuing plans because, as I said earlier, with our ticket prices, both at Berkshire Combat Center at Tippett Rise, we were already kind of on that path of trying to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we, one thing that we were plotting at Tippett Rise, and I really hope it, it happens as soon as we can, we kind of plotted a little road trip with three musicians, and I was thinking string player, something very mobile and easy to set up to do pop-up concerts in salons, coffee shops, galleries, wherever, you know, in, in Montana, just to go to really small towns. And I went, I went on a road trip to kind of scope out locations and it was so wonderful. And it also shows how people are so willing everywhere we went, people were like, you would just do that? <laughs> and I said, sure. And then it was so interesting because uh, then some had these kind of preconceived notions of where classical music should belong. So they would take me to like, like I remember this resort, they would they'd take me to this beautiful room where they would have like private parties or weddings or something. And I said, you know, I was kind of thinking your saloon 
they said they would play there. I said, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, with the right program. And, I, you know, we think like 15 or 20 minute programs. So that's something I would really love to do to, simply to, to make more attempts to break those barriers of, of and, and, and preconceived, you know, conceptions of what classical music is. And and British Conference Center, we've we've done that a lot, you know, as much as possible. I'm hoping to do kind of a street party in front of British Conference Center this summer uh, to further kind of you know say hi to our neighbors uh, as as the weather you know gets nicer. So I think I I, I absolutely I mean absolutely they would you know it's it's been. Uh, uh, in, in, you know, at British Combat Center, because we do music, dance, and theater, just by the nature of having three disciplines, there was such an amazing array of artists we've supported over the years. In classical music alone, it's a little harder to get that, that much diversity, but I think there's, there's a real much needed effort. And also to look at the past. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, you have these situations where that you know the, the the major works were premiered by black artists in the 18th century and we didn't know about it it's like how's that possible Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata really yeah. nobody knew a Bridgewater it's like really you have to white out that history <laughs> so it's I think it's so important to to understand that that, that didn't start today and so and just to build on it more and more which would be great how was your journey? Why, when did you decide you wanted to get in the arts and why are the arts important to you? Why do you dedicate your life to it? Uh, I think so much early on, it wasn't that conscious. It was, it was a, I was fascinated by, by music, uh, but I didn't think of it as, as a profession in any way. You know, I was too young to really think practically. But then of course, as I went to, I was born in, in what is now Bosnia. And then it was Yugoslavia. Then, and then when I was sixteen, I went to Zagreb, which is in Croatia now, to continue you play, my studies. You played piano already. You took lessons, or yes, yes, yes. I, I started. I played, played piano, though I didn't start that young. I started when I was nine, and oh. uh, I continued my education. And then I I wanted to go somewhere else, and you know, like. I don't know how you end up in, in the United States, but sometimes these are looking back, they're these kind of set of not quite accidents, but like I didn't know what I was doing. I, I went to audition at Curtis Institute. I, frankly, the only thing I knew about it was it was all scholarship because I had no money. So <laughs> so I was it was kind of dumb luck. And uh, then you know, I stayed here, I came to New York, I went to Juilliard, you know, quintessentially. Uh, you know, broke broke musician uh, will do whatever I can to you know make a living, but at the same time, I was always curious about everything. So, whatever gig came my way, I took it. So at some point, and I went to competitions, and I got lucky here and there, and I was you know playing concerts. But you know, it's, as you well know, making making a living in performing arts is not an easy proposition. And so I first my first foray in multidisciplinary collaborations was, was with Martha Clark. It was a co-commission between Lincoln Center and Netherlands Dance Theater, and I literally stumbled into it. I have this friend, Charlotte Helicant, who's a wonderful Swedish mezzo, and Martha was interested in working with her. I was visiting her in Glimmerglass where she was performing. We, were, you know, we went out for breakfast, and she had a meeting with Martha, and I was sitting you know, in, the, sort of, in another booth in this diner, and at some point, Charlotte came to me and she said, well, it's kind of ridiculous. I told Martha that I have a friend who is in Martha said, well, why don't you, why don't you just join us? <laughs> so I joined them and they continued conversations about this piece, which was all kind of German expressionism. And I said to her, but did you look at early, you know, Weber and songs? And, and finally, at the end, she said to me, you know, I will also need a pianist. Are you interested in being involved? In <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> so I stumbled up, upon that. And then... Through a dancer named Rob Besser, I met Misha Bereshnikov. I went on a tour with him, and you know, and then Misha said, "Oh, I want to build this art center," and I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so I, it's been an incredible. I, I now am of that age when people ask me for an advice, and my only advice is walk through any door that opens. <laughs> you can always walk out. 
So I had this incredible luck of meeting these extraordinary people. And then, you know, when the center opened, you know, uh, Misha had this idea that it would be a place of gathering of artists, of exploring and being together and, and multidisciplinary things. And uh, he, he said, we had two residents at very, I mean, we barely were open. And it was Benjamin Milpier and Azur Barton, two choreographers developing two different works. And at first our building was divided with uh, three commercial theaters and us on four floors above. And there was a, uh, a Hurley Burley was rehearsed down with, with Wallace Shawn and Parker Posey and Ethan Hawke. And at some point Misha said to me, well, why don't you ask a musician friend or something to come and you do a little concert for all the dancers and we'll invite the actors from downstairs. And I asked my friend Jennifer Frouchy, who's a wonderful violinist, and we did like 30 or 40 minutes. And then, you know, everybody said, it's such a great place for music. And I thought, well, I don't know. <laughs> so then we ended up with this amazing relationship and sponsorship by Movado. And I went on this meeting. I had never held a job of any kind other than play the piano. I went to this meeting and I said, I have this idea to kind of recreate the 19th century salon where you would come in, you would pick up a glass of something, you would sit at these tables, be nice lighting, and there would be an hour long concert. I, I hate intermissions. So for me, in ideal circumstances, I work, I go out at 6.30 or seven, I have a glass of something, I see or hear something for an hour, I go out for dinner and I go home. That's my ideal evening. So I basically spelled this out and they said, oh, that sounds great. Will we do work with this catering company? They did everything. I, I, I just kind of stood in disbelief that my dreams like that happened. So it was incredible. You know, I, I felt like the luckiest boy alive. So we had this really, you know, such, a, such an extraordinary opportunity to have really a carte blanche. You know, I, I created what was to me an ideal concert. And so then, you know, we've been at it for 15 years. And since then we've done many other things and are true. And from the beginning, I, I was fascinated with lights. And for the beginning, we asked for every concert. We had a lighting designer. We started with the great Jennifer Tipton and who did a lot of our concerts. And if not, she would send one of her students and she would say, this is great education for them. Very little rehearsal, just make it work. And so, <laughs> so we would create these beautiful atmospheres. And again, I would give them carte blanche. I would send them the music and say, this is what it is. You create the atmosphere from the moment we walk into the space, how it feels then what happens when the musicians go out. So it's been a really, really interesting. And then, you know, we did some really, you know, elaborate collaborations with, with true, you know, theatrical presentations of music. And then of course, all the other things in dance and, and theater, both in development and presentation. And then, uh, yes, about, I'm very bad with chronology. About four years ago, I was introduced to Peter and Kathy Halstead from Tippet Rise by my dear and unfortunately late friend, Charlie Hamlin. And I went to play there and I, I had never seen anything like it. You know, you, you go to this, you know, vast, you know, when they, when they call it big sky, they really mean big sky in Montana. And so, and the first thing you see when you get closer to anything, you see this Alexander Calder sculpture. You're like, wow. <laughs> and then, you know, you have this absolutely perfect, but could not be simpler concert hall that seats 130 people and 10 nine foot styleways on the property. <laughs> so it's this incredible, um, it, it's, it's a real feeling of being a guest in nature with invading as little as possible because these cottages are just incredibly organic to the land. They're wooden these structures and then these sculptures. And uh, to have this really organic care about the whole experience of a concert. There's a restaurant, you can get food, you can go on a sculpture tour, you can go hike or bike, you can hear a concert, you can go as a, I guess last, well, last year was nil, two years ago, the last structure we built at, at Tippet Rise was Xylem, which is actually the picture where I'm photographed on your website for this conversation, which is this incredible structure, which was basically, basically built for a place to just sit and listen to the sound of the brook or look around or speak with somebody. 
and it's all um, found wood from from uh, uh, from uh, forest fires, and it was designed by Francis Carré, who's an amazing architect from Burkina Faso who lives in Berlin. So it's this really it's it's the polar opposite of of an urban environment, you know. <laughs> and as such, what's interesting to me, uh, I think the actual concert and the way we intake the content is different. Here we come from this mad city that we love most of the time. And then we go into these kind of oasis of culture or arts or whatever. And then, but it does take us a little while to get there. And this is, we, we presented a couple of years ago, um, Corinna de Fonseca Wolheim's Beginner Ear, Beginner's Ear, which is a really, really interesting project in which she has a guided meditation for 20 minutes and then you hear 30 minutes of music. And her premise is that we are most often not even ready to intake music when we go into a space. Mm -hmm. Typically, the moment you enter the ranch, you are in a different state. So it's a really, really interesting. the The whole experience is 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 just fantastic. So, so it, I've been very lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is this is uh, also for our theater community is a big reminder that yeah, it does start when you cross. You know the uh, the store, and you get into a space like in Japanese tea houses. There's a little garden, and once you step over a stone, which even has a somebody has a white painting in the middle, you are and you go through the garden. You sit down, you take a shoe off, you walk, and then you go through a door that is very small. You, you originally to take your swords off, you wouldn't fight, and then you would look at it. Often, uh, points of discussions. If, important thing would take place and I think this is something perhaps that Corona time also um, put uh, back in our mind that is this something of significance to slow down to experience and to um, be um, in the moment and um, and that's what art and especially music of course are so great but yes we do so much and we run and if you go into a Broadway theater it's the opposite of it you know it's like cattle drives you go around you go in and out so it doesn't it's missing and I think I don't know how I don't miss that side so much but I miss more of what you talk about and, um, yeah and different, um, of it. how I asked John yesterday that you're also an artist and you're an arts administrator. Often, you know, the arts administration schools, now it's whether it's at Columbia and Brooklyn, so many, you know, the, at Yale or whatever, and they become specialists. But you're an artist. How, how significant is the fact that you're an artist and you are in charge and um, that you can make you know, decisions? You know, I think even more significant for both of those things that I'm a performer and an administrator is the fact that I've never stop being a consumer. I love going to performances. And I think it is that side that has informed me more than anything, both as a performer, as an administrator, like, you know, I, I go into performances and then you observe things that make sense or don't make sense. And you think, oh, I'm going to steal that. I'm, I like that. <laughs> so I think that's the part. And I know John is the same way, John Glover. Um, and I think that makes a huge difference. I think those who uh, never stop being audience then try to figure out what would make it better. So that's really my impetus on both ends, both as a performer, questioning all the conventions of performance. Like I always, you know, the length of the concert, but also why do we walk on and off stage all the time? I'm not exactly tired after seven minutes. Maybe I don't have to walk off. Maybe I could chat a little, you know? So all those decisions that the, the, these conventions in classical music, uh, I will never forget because at Bershkova Center, our production staff is, is theatrical. And of course at theater, it's a much tighter experience of the whole show. You do a real dress rehearsal in which, you know, there's curtain, to, you know, house to half, you know, then you do the whole thing in music. We, wing all that nobody ever speaks about what happens in between so we had a string quartet and they played you know a, a short piece like five minutes and they bowed people clapped they bowed then they walked off and our prediction production person ran to me she said is there something wrong <laughs> and i realized how senseless that convention is like where are they going <laughs> why <laughs> so that's really what interests me in, in concert presentations is to 
come uh, sort of go down to the essence of what is really necessary to convey this amazing content that, that we have at our disposal. And what are just these kind of things we do without even thinking about them, whether they produce any effect or, or what. So I, I think that's, uh, that informs me both as, a, as an artist. Of course, in, in my own performance, I've, well, I have certain freedoms in both sides. I don't like to invade artists' territory. If that's what they want to do, that's what I want to do. Nobody's gonna get surprised. Our audience is used to that. But if somebody comes to me and says, I have this idea, I'm always saying, okay, I'm all ears. Tell me, what would you like? <laughs> and it's not always possible, but, but it's nice to, you know, uh, and that has been really, for, for instance, this coming together project that we co-presented, Katie Hyun, who is a wonderful violinist and who was actually in our Tip Advice program tonight of these films, uh, she founded this ensemble called Quadlibet, which is kind of a, a collective of, of string players. And uh, for the actual Arzhevsky piece coming together, she had this idea because people were still spread out to, to individually film, to each to have each musician film themselves in something that looked like a confinement cell. Of course, they all joked that they were like, we're freelance musicians. My apartment is a confinement cell. <laughs> so, but, but it, they created this incredibly interesting video that was so, meaningful with with the work that was basically a staged version of that work so i think there's a lot of awareness once you open the door to to, to a lot of artists they will go through and they, they really there was so much thought put into all that so i think that's great yeah, yeah. and i i think it is a significant uh, uh sort of what one say you know appearance on stage that institutions where artists are in charge they create something even in the time of corona this is what i see and i would encourage all institutions also to say you know put artists in charge put them on the board and all diversity also, and really listen to them it's not just lips of give them trust them and hire them and give them um, the, the the wheel and i think it's working yeah. now it really shows who does something and who doesn't who really wants to do something for the people and it's not for their institution or for the artists themselves but i think as you said there's a great great awareness now that art has to be shared and how meaningful it is as you said all these people who say yeah of course you can perform here would you really say they're on both sides and they say yes of course we would do it and that it's not a commercial business that it's not just a big machine that we have to feed and that there's something more profound human and significant underlying and um the simplicity of it, as you said, that we are forced now, perhaps we are a bit uh, afraid to face it. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting, it's, it's such a, it really forces us to ask ourselves, what is art and uh, what, what purpose does it serve in life? And, and I think that's such a meaningful question to ask ourselves all the time, because just demanding attention or funding or coverage in newspapers or something, to me, it's sort of childish. Tell me why. Like, we, we just assume that it's this sort of entitled thing, but it's not. I think there is, and we can blame education or this and that, it doesn't really matter. We're in a situation where art has not touched everybody in our country or even in the world. So what is that bridge that we can build to say, hey, walk over. Maybe there is something in it for you, even though you think, you know, I, I've never heard of these people. I don't know who they are. So I think that's that's a really important quest. Mm -hmm. And the question that you said, yeah, I want the people in the bar to hear all that. You say the people outside, they are important. And we always knew that, but something happens. I think Susan Feldman um, spoke about it at St. Anne's. She said, you know, we couldn't do anything. So, okay, we did a concert on the roof. And people came yeah. in the garden. And she said, we have always thought so hard how do we engage the community? How do we do something where someone comes? And then like, for, we were forced to do this and it worked so beautifully in her great program. And she said, this is also changing us. And um, so um, I, we all hope and think something is happening. So really thank you for sharing, for sharing that. And um, also that, you know, what one hears from you that you really say, this is for the people, this is for the audiences and the low prices, which I think is such a big problem in New York, family, Four kids, uh, you know, somewhere um, you know, 
working class, however one would say and describe that, they can't go to a Broadway show. It would cost a thousand dollars if they all yeah. have something not possible. And also, yeah. you know, a hundred dollars you have Netflix all year and um, they will say, no, why? You know, this is even, there are better stories. And the, what it is of significance is the community, is the liveness. What are you working on at the moment? What are your, what's on your, uh, well, but also personally, what are you, what are you creating? What are you doing? A little bit something says, actually. A little bit Hayes, who also <laughs> it's incredible what he does at the same time. So, what are you working on for the two, the plans for the two institutions? But also personally, what are you creating? So, imminently, I'm doing something very interesting that's uh, been kind of busting my chops. Um, I am learning a work by a composer named Gregory Spears called Seven Days, which I'm starting to record next week. And his idea, which I think is very interesting, I guess that's why I'm doing it, is to explore what does it mean to hear music at different times of the day. So this, this project is meant to be uh, audio only and virtual. It's going to be done through an app in which you will receive a work and they range between three and eight minutes or so every morning, afternoon and evening for seven days. So there are 21 works and there's about 90 minutes or so of music. And I thought it was such an interesting idea along of these explorations, what, what is art and how do we react to it? Is it different? Do we assign a different meaning to a morning piece or to an evening piece? Because, of course, the beauty of instrumental music is that is, it is abstract. And that's, of course, I think why arts are important, because it's one of the few spaces in human existence where your opinion is all that matters. Nobody can tell you what to love or not to love in music or dance or visual arts. You can make your own decisions and you can and then five years later, you can change them. There's no there's no measuring stick. And that's the beauty of it. So, uh, so I've been really, really, and <laughs> given the strangeness of the strangeness of uh, how we function in pandemic times and how anything's possible, and the piece was sort of finished in, I guess, in December or so. And in in a regular quote unquote life, we would be talking about the premiere in two years from now. But here we are. <laughs> I'm recording it next week, so i I feel a little like. Uh oh, that's really soon. So I've been really working on that. I was in Atlanta last week, filming Chopin's Second Concerto with the Atlanta Symphony. And uh, for uh, Barishnikov Kumar Center, we are commissioning a new group of artists and now starting to think about, you know, residents. We are, we are accommodating some of the residents that we had to cancel last spring. So they are now coming during the summer to develop some works in the building. And we're starting to look into the, you know, future of live performances. And at Tipper Rise, similarly, we have commissioned some artists and we're continuing to film. And uh, we're looking, you know, into 2022 for, you know, live concerts, but very much aware that this, digital production will go on. And it's been very fascinating. A tip and rise side is also multidisciplinary because of the sculptures and also with very, very deep connections with poetry. So our films often have po poems in them and interspersed. And so it's been really, really kind of wonderful in both organizations to, first of all, I, I, I feel like a Santa Claus. For starters, you know, when, when pandemic hit, I couldn't be more proud of both organizations that immediately said, we will pay all the artists who were canceled because, you know, people's income just was gone. So we paid the fees and then immediately both Misha Bershnikov and Peter, Peter and Kathy Halstead immediately said, what can we do now? Now to really, you know, provide work. So it's been really, it's been amazing to be a part of that. And, and so we're, you know, continuing with that. And, but, you know, also really looking forward to, you know, being together, sneezing in public, just being around. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> well, yeah. listen, thank you really for Jeff for taking time out for rehearsing for this important thing. The videos you can all see on the Parishnikov Art Center website or? 
What's yes, the- so all all of the Bereshit Kumar Center at BACNYC.org, uh, everything is free and the same as at Tip and Rise, tipandrise.org. Uh, there's a lot of... BAC. Yeah, BACNYC.org and then tipandrise.org. Uh, and I think there might be somewhere in in the links with this broadcast, but I don't know, somewhere. Apple, uh, you can find on Apple on Apple. You just put in your name or yeah yeah you can then youtube and all all of those predictable spaces uh there's some wonderful videos actually both from bershko etc and tip rise on, on youtube and vimeo and, and on, on our websites one thing that has been really interesting because we're both small organizations we have consistently documented all performances so when the pandemic happened we had this library of of films that we could share and in, in both cases, we've also been dedicated to encourage artists to, to share because, you know, as a performing artist, you don't own anything and very often you can't get a video of it. So you have this history of performance with nothing to show. I mean, very little to show. So this has been a very conscious effort in both organizations to document and to encourage artists to say, this, share it, you know, post it, do whatever. So it's been wonderful to to, you know, go to because you know often we are so busy with with planning the new performances <laughs> and we are now as well but i mean this was such a time to really reach into those libraries and get those videos out so it's been really wonderful to revisit some of those performances and then invite the artists to speak and create little events around them and this and i would really encourage everybody to, to see both websites and particularly this weekend for the ticket rise we call it ticket rise on tour because we're not in our location, uh, these new films, which have been really a joy to to be part of. Yeah. Amazing. That's a good reminder. Document visual arts is so much better at it, but document your art and share it. You know, and all these concerns yeah. people have. Actors union, but this, so no, there is something of significance, and uh, we that perhaps it's changing, and uh, on both sides. Inside, it is. Uh, it is. There's also, a. And it's quite. Yeah, uh, to hear from you it's important to say this will stay this is not just a, a solution we were forced into uh we couldn't did you say no this is of importance we learned something and actually it's working and i say this is a very big uh, uh, um, announcement in a way and it would all put us to think also theaters um you know who were thinking should we do it at all or not and then they okay we'll do it but only till it starts again but there is perhaps something to discover and uh, i think some theaters in germany hired digitorks dramaturgs who are then responsible for digital arm or leg however whatever you want to call it so something uh, is moving is changing and perhaps in 50 or 100 years from now people say oh like, it all started at that time who knows but i think it, uh, the important thing to me to me is that to say that it's in addition to and not instead of it's definitely in addition to. We will never get tired of being with each other and experiencing performing arts at that moment and never again. Yeah. There's something so beautiful about that that it's not going to happen again. So that's great. It's great, but also something something new um, emerged. So uh, thank you, Petra, for really um, for sharing uh, um, um, your um, your uh, your work with us, and um, we are so um, thankful that you. Come, came to us, and that you are, uh, are able to uh, to share and are willing to do so. This is um, of significance and um, and of importance. So um, thank you so much. Next uh, week we go on. We will have uh, Rachel Cooper from the Asia Society, Elizabeth Hayes, formerly from Face. She's going to Palermo um, to the Bundy Theater, and uh, we will have artists from Indonesia um, and with us from Nigeria and from Switzerland. And so we will go on um, with our also global dialogue uh, and it's important to hear from you and what you do is so important for the city, for the arts as a symbol, as an imaginary space, but also as a real space. And we have so much respect uh, for your center and also Boryshnikov for putting it out there and creating it, but also you to make it happen. And that's a lot we can learn from. And uh, this is all very, very important and serious and it has consequences. What you say and what you did. So um, really thank you for sharing it to our audiences. Thank you for taking the time. As Petra said, so much is out there 
what it's a bit like it used to be the New York Times, you read a paper and then you got your information, but now we have the internet and we are confused about all this stuff that we could and should, or should not read in the same as was performance. It was pretty clear where you went and go, but all of a sudden it is a flood of things. And, uh, but still there are uh, institutions and artists we really should follow and pay attention to as someone said, we also have to pay attention what we pay attention to. So let's pay attention to these centers, to these institutions that you know, also showed in the time of Corona that producing, creating art is of significance and you found new ways. And we're still exploring, as you said. Thank you so much, everybody, and hello in your organizations and to the audiences. Hope you will be able to tune in next week. And thanks to HowlRound, our truly great host. We are so thankful to be there nationally and internationally present, our center is closed. I can't get it in my university without basically a police uh, officer going with me to my office completely. And I just got an email that also we will not be able to do live programming in the fall. Nobody even talked to me. We just got it in a mail. Um, so, um, but this is a reality and, um, and we also trying to do something. So it's very inspiring for us to hear. Thank you and thank you all. Thank you. Bye -bye.